my name is Crispina French and promoting creative textile reuse is my jam. I am an OG textile alchemist, worked my way through art school making ragamuffins from thrift store sweaters way back in the 1980s. That college side hustle grew into a full-fledged business and here I am today to show you how to do it too. Stick around for all the things helping to navigate both the chaotic and dreamy chapters of building your profitable textile upcycling business. We'll talk material sourcing, business savvy, product development, marketing, and self-care. Gloss over the hard parts? Not here. Experience, lessons, and know-how. Deep dive into the struggles, wins, and rewards of running your sustainable textile upcycling business. Think of this as your favorite craft class mixed with environmental business school. Are you ready to be inspired, energized, and supported? This is the Rags to Riches Textile Upcycling Podcast. This episode of the Rags to Riches Textile Upcycling Podcast is brought to you by The Unruffled. The Unruffled is a vibrant and feminine collection of slow-made garments and accessories handmade with love by Sandra Primo. Sandra is based in Austin, Texas, and every item she makes is thoughtfully constructed from finely sourced, reused textiles, favoring silks and lace and crochet. Bespoke, one of one, encouraging an infinite circle of recovery. Step into the world of The Unruffled at www.theunruffled.com. And visit the show notes page for this episode at Rags to Riches Textile Upcycling Podcast.com for links and more information. Hey, Rags to Riches listeners. I am really glad to be with you guys today. I have a special guest with me who I actually recently stumbled across, and his name is Doobie Duke Sims, and his business is called Snow Milk. And You know, Doobie, I don't know if you realize, but I have a background in screen printing. Like my mom and dad had a screen printing business. My sister and I actually run a screen printing business that was started in 1970. (laughs) So um, I am all about your product. I'd love for you to share, you know, first of all, like, where are you located? Talk about what you make, how you make it and where you came up with that cool name. Okay. So I'm in, I'm in Brooklyn, which is my hometown in I'm still here. The universe brought me back and I answered a Craigslist ad and that's how I ended up in a print shop. I had no concepts or ideas of anything having to do with silkscreen or printing or fashion or anything at all like that. Um, I was in a band called Shinobi Ninja. You can Google that. And we did a good decade on the road and I was on, you know, TV and magazines, songs and movies and video games. And I did the whole music industry thing for a good decade. And I've been doing it since I was like nine years old. I've been only doing music. I went to music conservatory, like my whole life has been dedicated to music. And somehow I answered this Craigslist ad because my daughter was about to be born and I just got off the road and the lead singer is my wife. And, you know, we're having this kid and just had to figure out some dollars. So Long story short, I ended up doing this and then I started running a screen printing t-shirt business or like, you know, a, a printing business. And then I built a recording studio because I already knew that business. And so I was running two businesses and then I got people to help me do those things. And I started focusing on the art and the visions, which I always had Photoshop skills and I always did the band merch. So I was already doing designs. And then I just started looking at different designs and I was using Shinobi Ninja because the sticker is pretty famous, especially in New York City, because I stickered it everywhere for bajillion years. And then I came up with Snow Milk right during like COVID. It was just an idea that came to me because my mom brought me up very health conscious. So even in the early 90s and late 80s, I had soy milk and almond milk and rice milk and nobody else had these things. So I was the weirdo and that was cool. But now we have oat milk and rice milk and hemp <laughs> milk and almond milk and so every type of milk that you could possibly have. So I was like, well, why can't you have snow milk? You know, milk made from the snow, which is just pure water, right? Because if you were to make milk from the snow, it would just melt and become water anyways. So you have to use your imagination, which is really about follow the yellow brick road, Willy Wonka, that whole thing. And then oh, I, I do be I'm flipping, yeah, this is awesome. I love you. Okay. <laughs> Follow the I, road with Willy Wonka drinking snow milk. I'm all about it. Yeah, I had never seen Willy Wonka until my daughter was born and then she started watching the Oompa Loompa. And we used to put it on and that's her nickname was Oompa Loompa. So then we started watching it and I was like, ooh, and then he said that one thing. There was that one scene where he goes, she goes, Snozberry. But when nobody's ever heard of a snozberry, and he was like 
He's like, we are the dream makers. We are the dreamers of dreams. And I was just like, oh my God, like, this is it, man. Like follow the yellow brick road, you know, create your own reality, you know? And I just started making all positive things, you know, words, hold power, choose them wisely. Think before you speak optimism as a way of life. Life is a painting you paint with the colors you have and just all the different positive things that I've was raised as like, I was raised as a Quaker. So I really got the hippie spirit from my mom. And I just, you put it into clothing with peace signs and flowers and all types of things like this. And then I started selling in Washington Square Park, which is a pretty famous park in New York. About two years ago, started pushing it in the park and started to see what people just were buying. Just on the street, like on the street, you were selling. Yeah, just a cart. I had a, a my homie Sakur was selling it. I've never sold the clothing. I've only just had visions of it. I'm not like a seller. I love <laughs> people too much for them to be like, oh, I love this or I love that. I don't want that type of energy. I don't, I don't thrive in that type of energy when people do that yeah. to me. I just kind of stay behind the scenes, but we started selling clothes and then started to see what people were buying repeatedly and what they weren't buying. And then my, my data mind, because my dad's a computer programmer. So he brought me up with like data and analytics. I started looking at, well, this is what they are buying. This is what they're not buying. Let me stop making what they're not buying. Let me focus on what they're buying and why they're buying it. And I'll just keep going with that. And I started doing that. And then fast forward the next year, we started doing street fairs and then festivals. And then I got in the Chelsea market and different markets and then some celebrities and football players. And then just bang, just like started. So this is so, so cool, because honestly, that that business advice that you just shared, which you probably don't even realize is business advice is like you do more of what's working and you do less of what's not working. <laughs> it's really what, that's how you run a business, right? Like I remember back in the day when I first started my business, I had, I worked at a gallery and the guy said to me, I told him I was starting a business. And he said to me, as long as you, as there's more coming in than going out, you're doing it right. And I was like, that's all you really need to know. Right? Like, and when you're working to feed your family and you're, you're growing a family, you got young kids, like you have to, right? There's no, it's not like you are doing this for fun or you're, you know, you got a trust fund that's supporting you. It's like, you're, you're making it work so that you can have this beautiful lifestyle, right? That Willy Wonka introduced you to. Yeah. Well, I mean, being in the music industry and just making music all my life, I didn't care at all what people thought or what they liked. I didn't give a shit. I only cared yeah. about what I liked and the the voice of, of what was in my head. Right. Somehow, Somehow I've connected some type of dots or the universe is lined up and, or I'm just very lucky or I'm talented or whatever it is, whatever I do works and I'm not attached to it in any way. There's no ego really involved in it. So if I make a design and people don't like it, I don't care. I'll just move it to the side. I'll go to the next one. Cause I really, it's for fashion is different than music because fashion, the consumer has to purchase the, the hoodie or the shirt or the dress and they have to wear it. And that means that they have to love it when they buy it and when they put it on when it's in their closet. So that's just service and life. I really feel that life is service is about giving and it's about bringing value. So how can I be of service to humanity and, and, and bring goodness and kindness. And so through clothing, it's just like, well, let me make things that you want that make you happy. That's, that's the job that I'm doing. God, that's amazing. I just love that. So talk about the product that you make. Cause I've seen it. I've been prowling around following you a long time. Well, I, I probably a year. And I just feel like it's just so unique. Talk about how you make your product. What is it? Well, I have a, I have a six screen press here. You know, I have an oven. It's a small studio, but this was all set up by my partner, Will, Will Nieves and the Nieves, Nieves dance studio. He teaches salsa and bachata. You can Google that as well. He put this we'll all put together. In the show notes. We'll put links to those two things you shared. And if there's others, we'll put them in there too. Yeah. Will has been a blessing to me. So he started this business before me. And I had just nothing, no concept of this whatsoever, but I taught myself on YouTube and basically it's just at this point, it's like you get garments, right? I, I, I'm, I'm at, at a scale now where I have to get a lot of garments, like um, like a small amount's not going to s- do it. I sell, t- you know, a thousand to two thousand pieces per month. So I have to have a large quantity, which means I'm purchasing from like huge bulk thrift wholesale warehouses. You buy it in bales. You buy bales. I don't buy bales, um, but I, I just purchase in mass quantity where it's yeah. like, yeah. I'll be like, well, how much for these coveralls? They're $5. I'll take a hundred of them. How okay. much for these pants? They're $3. Yeah. I'll take a hundred of them. Yeah. So that's just kind of, and um, then I get the clothes and I have different visions. I have workers that print the clothes and every day they come in, they got a couple shifts to make the clothes. I got people that drop tag it, put the vinyls on it. Each piece is individually numbered. And then they get, they get ready to go out the door and then sellers come, they take them and then they sell them. Yep. So then, so when you, 
all your, I, correct me if I'm wrong, this is just what I, I believe is that your the product that you're selling is actually secondhand. Like the clothing that you're printing on is you're sourcing it from people who can provide you the volume that you need, but it's all used clothing, right? Um, It's not all used clothing. I would say about 80% is used. I, okay. I did get to a point where it's I, I'm I'm still figuring this out. Like I feel like I'm a little baby. I'm like a second grader in this <laughs> business. So as a second grader, I'm still skidding my knees and doing all this stuff. But yeah. um like I I had to figure out volume. So it was like, yo, we need hoodies, we need hoodies, we need large hoodies, we need extra large hoodies. Like, where am I getting this? I'm ordering it wholesale. They're gonna yeah. send it boxes, I'll get them as cheap as I can. But yeah. if I can, I wanna see the earth and bless the earth. So I'm, yeah. of course I wanna get everything upcycled. If I could order a thousand large hoodies upcycled, I will take that any day over brand new wholesale hoodies. I can help you with that and I will after that we record this. Um, so that's awesome. So then your imagery is something that I also like super just love. Can you talk about how you create your images? Oh, well, me, I draw like a, can sorry, I interject just for a second? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you know, if I'm listening to this podcast and I, I'm not really sure like what snow milk is and I'm like, wow, this guy's really interesting. What a positive spend. Cool. I, I am. Oh, screen printed clothing. Okay. I've seen that before. You have not seen that before. This is not what you've seen that screen printed clothing. Okay. Let me just put that rest assured that this guy is like, Doobie has got this creative sense where there's, you know, it goes off the edge of the clothing. It's not like sun. It's not like here's an image in the middle of your sweatshirt and, you know, or in the middle of the back of your sweatshirt. It's like, no, this is like a whole nother level. This is next level screen printed clothing. Just FYI. Okay, now tell us about it. Oh, what was your question again? I lost the question. I want to. I want you to describe like your imagery and what your clothing looks like, and how who who is it for? Like who is just loving it up? And like what what what's the? You know, you talked about how you wanted to make clothing that like brought joy to people. So talk about the how that looks to you, like what you see when you're making your clothing, and how it physically looks. Well, I think the success really comes from the fact that there is no specific demographic, right? You can be, I make clothes for toddlers. I can make clothes for dogs, dog streetwear and, you know, kid streetwear all the way up to grandmothers. You know what I mean? So it doesn't matter. It's, it's unisex. It doesn't matter. It's male, female. It doesn't matter. Gay, straight, like whatever labels you want to put, that's irrelevant. And so it's not an ageist thing, right? So it, it appeals to everybody. And the reason why I think it appeals to every, everybody, which will be a strong indicator that I don't know what I'm talking about, because usually what, what I see is not correct. But I just feel that like I draw like a seven year old and somehow like the youth is is in our society. It's like it's like it's here in the blink of an eye and then it's gone and you become an adult and then the world just feeds you adult stuff like CNNs and colors and races and all these different things that it feeds you that really have nothing to do with like being at, uh, attached to the universe and children are just naturally attached to their imagination and to just wonderment. Like, like when do we talk about wonderment? Like I love the, I love these things. So when I draw something or when I come up with something, like I'm going to, I'm going to put the sun on this or I'm going to put, you know, the, the earth or I'm going to put a rainbow. I'm going to put a flower or a peace sign or whatever it's going to be. Like I have a, a concept of it and then I'm going to go on top of that. That's not enough. Like, like one print is not enough. It has to be everywhere. I want the clothes to be everywhere. I want to blend colors. I want to put multiple designs on top. It's like, if I'm going to do one screen, it has to have one message and the message should make you think. But if it's not that, then it's going to be the sun with another thing printed on the top and it's going to be on the sleeves and it's going to be on the hood and it's going to be on the sides. It's going to be everywhere. You know what I mean? So it's just like all, all things all the time. Oh my goodness. That was the best description ever. So you guys, okay. Snow milk. I saw you first on Instagram. Is that kind of like the main place where you go, where you are on social media? It seems to be the place where things are popping the most. So Good. yeah, I'm right with it. Good. it's a great feed. So check it out. Snow milk. Okay. All right. So if you guys are just joining us, this, my, my guest today is Doobie Duke Sims of a company called Snow Milk based out of Brooklyn, New York. And um, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back. 
Today's episode of Rags to Riches podcast is brought to you by the Stitcherhood Recycling Society, my online membership community for creative textile upcycling, recycling, and reuse entrepreneurs. Inspiration, shared experience, tutorials, business savvy, and connection to a whole posse of people who understand the passion and intricacies of running an environmentally kind creative textile upcycling biz. Daily posts, weekly stitch hours, book recommendations, group chats, member profiles, and strong connections is what you can expect when you join Stitcherhood. Head on over to stitcherhood.crispina.eco and sign up for a free seven-day trial to see if my Stitcherhood Recycling Society is a good fit for you and your textile upcycling business. All right. Um, We're back with Doobie Duke Sims. I am Crispina French, your host of Rags to Riches podcast. And today we're talking to Doobie Duke about his business called Snow Milk and about how he upcycles clothing. And there's so many things I love about your business, Doobie. The the um the aesthetic just to start with you were describing that before the break and and what a beautiful job you did it's it's just all over bright cheery um layers uh it makes you it makes you think of um it has a love a lay a depth to it that isn't initially a, you, you don't sort of notice it at first and then you're like oh my god there's so much to this right like you you kind of can dive into it a little bit which is so cool and the way that I love and then the other thing I really love is that you know I've been upcycling clothing for like a very long time and in my mind when I think of upcycling clothing I think either people are doing vintage stuff, you know, like vintage stores or even like thrift, the thrift stream, or people are taking clothing and, you know, reconfiguring it, cutting it up, sewing it together, changing the way it looks in some way. But what you are doing kind of falls right in the middle, right? So you're, you're buying the used clothing um, in volume, and then you're not really cutting it up and reconfiguring it. You're just dressing it up and making it awesome. And I just wonder if you've thought about that and thought about how you're giving like a life to a piece of thing that has not had that life given to it prior. Yeah, I have thought about that. And it's a blessing because you could take something that's made from the gap that was originally a $30 sweatshirt and print on it and sell it for $85. So you take something that literally was about to be garbage and sell it for more than it originally was even manufactured for. Yeah. And that's because you put your magic in it. Yeah. It's all magic, man. This is all magic for sure. (laughs) Totally is. I so agree with you. And you know, it's so interesting how I remember um, years ago, I was listening to something on the radio and they were talking about how they were talking down about the thrift store, um, like secondhand clothing. And it had something, I I wish I had more information, but it was somebody in our government who was talking about how you know, there should be like more restrictions around, who, you know, how they go about selling thrift clothes because they have like negative energy in them. And I was like, I don't think that's true. I think that it's actually positive energy. And I think that, you know, clothing has the the energy that whoever wore it put into it. Right. And then whoever made it put into it and whoever like packaged, like there's so many hands that touch a piece of clothing between the concept of like, I'm going to make a sweatshirt or I'm, you know, if you're gap, I'm going to make 4,000 of this one unit, you know, in this one hour or whatever. And there's all of this, this sort of chain of human touch that happens in that industry that a lot of people are completely unaware of. And then when it goes to the thrift stream, it's like all of that energy gets kind of thrown away. It's kind of like, oh, we don't want you. But then when you're like, hey, wait a second, let me pull that back out because I'm going to give it more life. It's like you imbue you're um, like, it's a sacred duty that you are creating this, you know, magic, maybe it gets thrown around too much, but I totally think that it's true. It's like, it's alchemy. You're turning something that is seen as valueless into something really magical. And I just feel like that is, we get to do this all day, Doobie. (laughs) This is what we get to do. (laughs) where Where we are definitely blessed. Oh my gosh. And, you know, I stop and think back and I'm like, I have actually never punched a clock for anybody that wasn't myself. I mean, there's been times in my life where, you know, I've worked with other people um, in my business, but I look back and I just think, my, some, my, so, there are people in the world who spend their whole lives punching a clock, doing something they don't really like or care about, or maybe they don't even, they really don't like it. Like it's ugh, like 
repulsive or whatever. And like, we get to walk around and be creative and, and talk about how it's possible for other people to do that. And that's one of the things I love about what I do is I feel like and talking to you and just using that, like you guys listen to this guy, listen to his energy and like how he, you are living a happy life. I can tell just through talking to you here, you know? Well, it's all about, it's all about perception. But I think, I think that even, even if I was somebody to punch a clock, if I had the same clarity that I have, I knew that I would know that it would still be about service. And if you can just go through life being of service, and being aware of your environment at all times, then opportunity is around you at all times. And then it's just a matter of what do you want? Because you can have the things that you want if you're aware of the opportunities around you and you treat them as such. Like when you when you want to date a girl or a guy or whatever, it's like you gotta you gotta look your best, smell your best on that first date. You don't go looking like how you're gonna look in seven years on a Sunday. You know what I mean? Like it just doesn't work. You have to treat the environment in certain ways to understand. And it, it is about being opportunistic. And I've never really enjoyed that type of energy. But if you can be aware when you walk in the bodega that these are your friends, right? Thank you for being a friend. It's yeah. like if you can be aware that everybody is your friend then yeah. it's classic Earl Nightingale's when you change the way you look at the world, the world you look at changes. And it can be a really dark place if we have to watch CNN all the time and just hear about destruction, then we dream about destruction, right? But if we just look at goodness and we live goodness, then when we speak, we speak goodness, right? And then the people around us go like, fuck, listen to that. He's actually talking about goodness or she's talking about goodness. And you say, well, that's going to be contagious, isn't it? Because negativity is contagious. So positivity is also contagious. It's just a matter of which, which flow you're doing. Yeah, totally true. So I just, I, this is all so resonating with me. I remember one time, this is a kind of a funny story that speaks right to that. I was traveling with my dad. My dad and I traveled a bunch. He was a really good friend of mine and he passed away. Oh gosh, it's been like, I don't know, could be 10, 12 years ago. But we tra- when he was getting toward the end of his life, my mother was like, I really don't want to travel with you anymore. She was tired of it. She said, yeah, you can go wherever you want, but you can't go by yourself. And I was like, pick me, I'll go. So we went to Cuba and um, we, you know, I did a bunch of reading about Cuba, about the Cuban culture. And I was really excited to go check it out. And we get to Havana and it's late at night and it's, you know, we landed at like 11 PM and we went to the place we were staying and we thought, ah, we've been sitting on a plane for so long. Let's just go out for a walk, walk around the city and check it out. You know? So we were walking together and my dad had a camera, like not a phone camera. This, you know, it wasn't that long ago. Like people did have phone cameras at the time, but he had like a camera with a flash, like something you put a film in, you know, (laughs) and he's taking pictures of people on the street. And I was like, dad, could you please flipping stop doing that? Like you're making every, everybody on the entire street is looking at us right now. And like, we're tourists. I don't even know. Like, could you just like chill the hell out? You know? So he was like, whatever, you know, listening to me for a second and then not really listening to me. And then he kept doing it. So after a while, I was like, dad, you know, I I just feel so uncomfortable right now. Like, could you understand that please? And he was like, what are you scared of? And I was like, I I don't know. I just don't feel like I know this culture and I'm feeling like uncomfortable that people are looking at me. He's like, there's nothing to be scared of, you know, enjoy yourself, hang out, chill, have fun. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try that. And then I realized what he was doing when he was taking pictures was talking to the people. He spoke Spanish and getting their addresses. So, you know, he goes home and gets his little roll of film developed and he had everybody's address and he all sent them pictures. Well, we went back to Cuba like two or three years later and everybody on the street, John French, oh my gosh. And like welcome to into their homes and they didn't have photographs. They didn't really have cameras in Cuba at the time. This was like probably in like 19, like probably 2002, maybe it was. And it was just like, you know, he made, uh, he made international friends by taking pictures of totally mortifying his daughter in the process. But it's just like that thing about like, yes, you walk in the bodega, these people are your friends. There's nothing to be fearful of. Fear is like what we are fed. So like turn on the news and all I got to do is be scared of everything, right? Don't go to school because you're going to get shot. Don't, you know, breathe the air because they're going to light a train on fire. Don't do this. Don't do that. Honestly, everybody's doing okay. I mean, there are people who are suffering. Believe me, I get that. But like generally, People are pretty awesome. For sure. Well, your dad was doing service, right? He was giving. So that's, <laughs> that's what he did, Doobie. Like, that's what he did. He just, 
the man had such a magical life. It was, and just to watch that and look back at it and be like, oh, what a gift he gave me to see that, you know? For sure. I mean, another yeah. thing, another thing about business is like, if you want to make a lot of money, you have to provide a lot of service. So money really follows value and value is part of service. So if you just kind of put it all together, like business and life, actually they go hand in hand because it's really about how you're treating the environment and how you can give to the environment. And if you're not really giving a lot, then you don't really, you know, you not don't expect a lot for more, more that is given more is expected. So you really got to see who you are and, and what you have to give. And once you start giving all that, just expect is give and receive. The more you give, the more you receive. And then the thing is, the more you receive, the more you have to give. And that's the reciprocation of it. Well, you know, that's such a cool thing to think about. I think for the longest time, I was a giver. I would give, give, give. And it was the hardest thing for me to receive. Have you ever felt that way? Well, you might have been given to the wrong people or the wrong avenues. Well, yeah. And I think also it was, it was a block for me. Like I felt like I was, I, I was not able to receive. And then actually it's, this is another story. I'll tell you my husband got really badly injured in November. A tree fell on him. He's a tree guy. And you know, I said to him two weeks before I got hurt, I said, sweetheart, you know, you really don't see a whole hell of a lot of 60 year old tree guys running around. I said, let's, let's think about this. You know, we were joking. He was in a, he was in a play actually, oddly enough. And he, um, I was like, why don't you do voiceovers or something? And, um, we were joking. And then literally two weeks later, he gets hurt. And, you know, we live in this very small town in the, in, you know, very rural Massachusetts. And, um, for the first 10 days he was in the hospital and he, first of all, let me just tell you that he did not get a head injury and he did not get a spinal cord injury and he broke tons of bones, including his back and he's going to be okay. So there's a miracle in itself right there. And that whole first like couple weeks of time where I was just like, oh my gosh, like what the heck? My whole world just turned upside down. And my, I have teenagers at home and like what, you know, it's, it was just before Christmas and people brought us dinner every night. Like I didn't, I don't even know who they were. I would just come home after being in the hospital all day with him. And like, there'd be dinner on the, you know, my daughter would say, Oh, I don't know who it was, but somebody just brought this bag of dinner. in." And I was like, Oh my gosh. And it was so hard for me to receive, to be like, I was like, Oh my gosh, like, should I write them a thank you card? Like, how do I reciprocate? And I don't know who they were. So I, I can't reciprocate. And they just wanted to help me. And I was learning to receive. And it's like, since that experience, Every, like, it seems like doors have just like sprung open in every place that I look, because I think for so long, I was just feeling this obligation to, oh, I don't need that. I don't need help. I don't need to receive. I can just give, 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 <laughs> you know? And like you said, you got to give and receive. For sure. And worthiness is important too. The feeling of worthiness that you can't, that you are worth receiving. Do you know what I mean? That's a large concept as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to know, like when you were growing up in your, in your household as a kid, were, were these sorts of, um, sort of philosophies practiced by your parents? How did you come by this thought process? Well, I grew up in Bensonhurst. Also shout out to Massachusetts. I lived in Lawrence, Massachusetts for a bunch of years. I, you know, I love small town Massachusetts. That's how I even started doing thrifting. Shout out to St. Vincent's de Paul thrift store in Lawrence, Massachusetts, because once a week, there's, they change colors and whatever is the color of the day is a dollar. So I would get things for a dollar, whatever it was. If it was green, doesn't matter if the t-shirt, hoodie, trench coat is a dollar. So that's, wow. how I got, that's how I got started in this whole game. Anyways, um, I grew up in Bensonhurst in the 80s and the 90s, which was a very violent place. It was where the mob was. It was during the crack era. It was very racist. So I grew up like one of my first memories of life was in 1987. This kid named Yusef Hawkins got killed by these two Italian kids. He was a um, African American, and he got killed because he like he was like with their girlfriend or something. It was like so like Shakespearean or something. But I just knew that it was wrong. And, and Al Sharpton went by my house, and that was like one of my first memories ever in life. Um, so I just knew what didn't feel right. And then my mom raised me as a Quaker. And that's when I started to see like, you know, lesbians, gay people and, you know, just all types of people and how they, we all sat together and we all ate together and we meditated and we had affirmations and things that I just never saw before, but have resonated with me forever because that's kind of hard to forget those type of things. Once you yeah, see those things. Like, yeah. The open-mindedness, right. And the, the acceptance of, of all. 
Yeah, I mean, that's it, man. This is, you know, it's like you can see those things. If they taught those things in school, if they taught like oneness, you know what I mean? Like togetherness, if they taught those concepts, yeah. I think just the world would just be a much different place. Like when I grew up in, you know, as the Quaker is like, you go to these like retreats and like they'd have this manila folder, right? And like they, it would just be only affirmations and had everybody's name on it and just be uh, taped on the wall. And then yeah. people would just put affirmations in your folder, just like, I love David because he's this, or I love you because he's this. And I'm just like, this yeah. is wild, man. Like, I never saw this before in my life. All I saw was just like negativity and like racism and like, this is yeah. my block. Why are you on my block? So once I saw those things, it was just like, I can never unsee those things. And I'm just going to just keep riding with that frequency. Well, yeah. And you know what the alternative is and how it affects the, the, the people in it, right? Like you've seen that, like you grew up there with this violent, um, world outside your walls where it was like, oh man, like, let's not do that. Let's, what, what are the alternatives here? Let's figure this out. Um, so, so cool. So I want to, um, also just, uh, ask if somebody's interested, like uh, people can, we'll, we'll have a whole show notes page with like, um, links to stuff. But I, I often listen to podcasts when I'm not like somewhere that I can hop on my computer and look at a show notes page. So talk about how people can find you and where you're selling your work and how people can track you down if they're driving or doing something where they're not able to hop on a, on a computer. Okay. You can go, the website is real Um, the Instagram is real snowmilk.com. Uh, oh, yeah, real, real snow milk. Everything, all social media is real snow milk. Instagram probably is the biggest one, but Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, you can find me at Doobie Duke Sims. I have a YouTube channel and I put everything on there. You can find me on all social media at Doobie Duke Sims. Um, real snow milks on TikTok. What else is there? If you want to listen to music, like I said, I come from music, so you can go to Spotify or anything and type in Duke Sims and you can find music. I've been doing music since I was like a kid, man. I done put out 20 something albums. Like all I've ever done in my life is music. So if you want to see everything, all the vibrations that I did before I ever made clothes, just Google that and you can look up Shinobi Ninja. If you want to see me in the band setting. Um, that's it. Clothing, snow milk, just, you can find it. That's awesome. Hey, thank you so, so much. What a super pleasure to just learn about you and your business and your mindset. And um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely be staying in touch with you, my friend. Um, thanks again. It was a pleasure. Um, and if anybody's interested in tracking down my new best friend, Doobie Duke Sims, go on our show notes page at rags to riches eco. And you can um, find all kinds more information on there. Um, he mentioned a couple things that um, we will tag on there as well with links to sites that were pertinent in the conversation. So Doobie, thank you so much. Blessings. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, so I'm over here and I'm serving you a giant air hug because you just finished another episode of the Rags to Riches Textile Upcycling Podcast. Thank you for being with me. Our music is provided by The Lucky Five. Learn more about them at theluckyfive.com. Our show is produced and edited by Van Hyacin. If you want to dive in deep, head over to Rags to Riches Textile Upcycling Podcast.com.